Jesus is the reason for the season. And, um, it's a great slogan, and one used to counteract the commercialism and worldliness that we find around this time of year. It's a fitting rebuttal to the world's idea of Christmas. The world's idea that comprises Santa Claus, reindeers, elves, and the like. Quite frankly, those things are fun. They're fun elements that the world has added. But they are the world's idea. The thing is, the world used to know that Christmas was about the birth of Jesus. But nowadays, it's hard to find people who even use the term Christmas. The other day, my team at work was in a meeting. We were with one of our senior directors, and that senior director had everybody put a greeting in to everybody else. And there were 15 greetings. 14 of them said Happy Holidays. One of them said Merry Christmas. Ooh. And that director read out 14 of them. Oh. It was actually very amusing to see this stark reminder that people are afraid of Christmas. <clears throat> thing is, a lot of it has to do with the woke Gestapo who have operatives everywhere these days. I know it's at my, my corporation. And the thing is, is they become the no-fun police anyway. <clears throat> But they have a way of damping down everything that's fun to begin with. But they focus on things that are Christ-related. And it made me wonder, as I was sitting there, about our response. Because I know that the world has gotten to the point where paranoia has changed how they talk, how they speak, how they even think. Maybe wonder that, are they averse to using the term because whether they admit it or not, they know that Jesus is the reason for the season? Mm -hmm. It's much easier to distance oneself by using the generic term holidays. Now, I know around this time there are a couple other holidays that are celebrated. But in my experience, I don't say that see the same kind of people watching their mouth around Hanukkah or Kwanzaa. Thing is, the world is always going to find ways to avoid and acknowledging Jesus. Mm -hmm. In this season, especially now that Santa Claus is not only normalized, but he's a preeminent figure in the celebration of Christmas. They have every avenue of avoiding Jesus. But here's my real question. How many Christians need to be reminded that Jesus is the reason for the season? And how many Christians focus on a baby being born, rather than the arrival of the King of Kings. Mm. <clears throat> Let me ask you, if I said a baby was born today who one day was going to do earth-shattering things that would directly affect you, would your behavior change at all? But what if I told you that the King had arrived? Then? Would your behavior change at all? Would your interests or attitudes be any different? You know, almost all Christians have some idea of what Christmas means. That Jesus was born. But do we really understand? Do we really internalize? Do we really grasp the fact that Jesus, the Savior of mankind, 
The king of kings is the reason for the season. Or, when it comes right down to it, do we just focus on the baby part? Because it's Christmas time. Because we see the creches and the nativity scenes. We see the baby represented. Do we say, okay, that's Christmas time. We'll think about the rest at Easter time. We'll think about when Christ comes back, if we ever read Revelation. But what does Christmas mean for us on a day-to-day -day basis? <clears throat> like we discussed last week, Christmas is a time we think of as a season of putting aside our differences and exercising peace and goodwill. And this is nothing new. I mean, there have even been Christmas truces in wartime. Like in 1914 in Belgium, when the British and the German forces declared a one-day truce, where instead of firing weapons at each other, they traded comfort items, and they played soccer or football, if you prefer. And they did it because it was Christmas. We're studying Philippians 2, where Paul talks about the nature of godly relationships. And as we saw last week, Paul, after listing out the characteristics that lead to godly relationships, he then gives the Philippians a specific example, a model of how to conduct relationships, even more specifically, how to have the mindset to conduct godly relationships. This model and example that he gives is in the form of a hymn or a song. And today, we're going to look at the next verse in the passage. But let's start back reading in Philippians 2, 5, and we'll go through 8. <coughs> Philippians 2, we'll start at 5, and we'll go through 8. Philippians 2 5 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask this morning that your name will be glorified, that Christ's name will be lifted up, that we will understand the nature of our Lord Jesus Christ in the context of this season and in the context of every day and how it impacts our relationship by understanding the humility that our Lord and Savior, that the King of Kings exhibited and is a model for us. We thank you and praise you. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Last week we started looking at this song of Jesus as documented by Paul gives us insight into the very essence and meaning of Christmas. First off, Paul sets the context of his relaying about Christ in the context of relationships. The thrust of his previous list of characteristics of godly relationships tied to humility. So now he's continuing his logic by establishing this example, by singing the song of Jesus. He points out that Jesus was God in form, or as the NIV translates it, nature. He was God, and yet he never used that privilege to avoid what his father had planned. And because he was unwilling to exploit this privilege and the rank 
and the nature that came with royalty, he made himself nothing. He poured himself <coughs> out. He emptied himself, not of divinity in the slightest, but he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. One thing that's really interesting to remember, anytime we get high and mighty, when he came down, he took on the form of a servant. And what was that form? It was a human. It was a man. So I think right there, when Jesus came down to take on the form of a servant, and that servant is a man, it should remind us that we have little to boast about on our own. But he emptied himself by taking on that form. And if you remember, the Greek word that's used there is morphe. It means an inward connection to the outward expression. So he took on the form of a servant because he became a servant. He took on a servant by... Being God before, he, because he was God, he was in nature, in the form of God. Now that, that word servant, it actually means everything from a slave to a bonded servant. But here he was, God the Son, and yet he took the very form of a servant. Being made in human likeness, correlates to the Christmas story because he was born on this earth. But he was like no other baby ever. He was born flesh and blood, but he was so much more than a baby, more than just a tiny human. In fact, verses 6 and 7 explain the very prophecy of Isaiah 7:14. That says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel literally means God with us. That is the first aspect of the Christmas story. And so we arrive at verse 8. Verse 8 says, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, the Christmas story is so much more than one <coughs> point in time. It is a way station. It's a culmination of all the prophecy in the Old Testament, which points to his earthly ministry. And then points to his eventual second coming. Verse 8 focuses on this second aspect of the Christmas story. What he was here for. It says, and being found in appearance as a man. What's interesting is that the word used here for appearance is a different one than the one used for form. It's similar, but it's contrasted with morphe in that it represents the external shape. But it's not just a superficial shape. Rather, it comprises the characteristics of the form in external ways. Jesus was born as an actual flesh and blood human, but one with a very distinct difference. He was born without sin. He didn't even carry with him the stain of original sin. And this is about one of the many ways that he was different. But the actual form, the appearance, was that of a man. When Jesus came to this earth, he may have given up his glory, his privileges, that external form that we can only imagine. But he never left his divinity. He was always the Son of God. 
So what does this mean, that he took on the appearance of man? It meant that he took on a human body that included the natural mechanisms of the body. For example, Jesus got hungry. Matthew 4, 1 and 2 says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Jesus also got tired. John 4 records this in verses 4 through 6. John 4, 4 says, Now he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son jo Jacob, Joseph. Since Jacob's well was there, Jesus, weary from his journey, sat down by the well. Hebrews 4 encapsulates all of this in verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So think about this. The Son of God, God himself, stooped to take on a human body with all its inherent weaknesses. When he found himself in this human body, did he give it back? Did he say, I don't want this. Did he forsake his human body? No. What did he do when he found himself in this human body? It says he humbled himself. He humbled himself. The thing is, he had already humbled himself to give up his privileges, to give up his prerogatives, to give up his glory, to come down to this earth, to be born. And so he humbles himself again, though. He had already humbled himself. Now he's humbling himself after he finds himself as a human. So the question is, how did he do this? How did he humble himself the second time? By becoming obedient unto death. He became obedient. The question is, to whom was he obedient? This verse does not explicitly say but since we know that he constantly mentioned doing his Father's will, it logically follows that he was obedient to God to the Father, even unto the point of death. And I think that we take this fact for granted. After all, aside from him coming to earth as a baby, the most prominent image that we and the world have is Jesus dying. But think about this. Jesus had never personally known death. He was God. He'd always existed. And while humans knew death after the fall of man, Jesus had never known it personally. He had never experienced it. He had no reason to know it, nor take part in it outside of his Father's will. And yet he humbled himself even more by obediently facing death. And to take his humility even further, he didn't just become obedient unto death. He became obedient unto a specific time of death. He didn't die of old age peacefully in his sleep. That wasn't God's plan. And that itself, the best death that we can imagine would be nothing but a humiliation for the Son of God. And he could have even demanded that if he wanted. But that was not God's plan. He became obedient unto death on a cross. Death on a cross was a punishment reserved for the lowest criminals. It was a public 
humiliation. Our Lord humbled himself in every way in his saving work. But you ask, how is this related to Christmas? How is this the second aspect of Christmas? Because it wasn't just a baby born in a stable in Bethlehem. Yes, he was an infant. Although conceived supernaturally, he was born naturally. But this baby was more than a baby. He was born a savior. We saw it last week. We read about it, and Tristan read about it earlier as well. When the angels tell the shepherds in Luke 2, says, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Jesus was born a Savior from the beginning. He was announced as a Savior from the beginning. And that was what his earthly ministry was all about. He was fully God. He was fully man. So Christmas is not about a baby. <coughs> it is about a Savior. A Savior that stoops so low that as Hebrews 2.9 says, but we do see Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while. Again, we need to grasp and understand the humility that Christ took on <coughs> this Christmas time and every day. When we celebrate Christmas, we shouldn't be as the world is, either letting Christ be edged out of the setting nor even be like those in the world who merely see a baby. But we should understand that Emmanuel <coughs> not to just be among humans for a little while, but he had a specific purpose on this earth, to be a savior. And that should humble us right there. We should be thinking about that on Christmas Christmas Eve, and Christmas Eve Eve, and the day after Christmas. Every day, we should be reminding ourselves of the humility <coughs> that Christ took upon himself. And if we are humbled by the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, came to be a Savior for us, how much more humble should we be who have always been made lower than the angels? Again, Christmas is a time when we think of doing nice things for people, putting aside the disgruntled ways we have with other people, having peace on earth, showing goodwill. But for us, every day we are called to do that. Because Christ did it first. Aspect number one of, of Christmas is that he chose to be born on this earth. Aspect number two is that he chose to be born a savior specifically for that purpose. Yes, Jesus is the reason for the season. But this Christmas season, may we understand the full extent of just exactly